Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, Hello again. <laughs> welcome to, to Bacia. Welcome to Larry. Welcome to Robert, to Mendel, to Sarah, to Liba, Christo, Diane, Asher, Davida, Eugenia, David, David, uh, Tim, my son, Label, Sarah Malka, Larry. Okay, beautiful. Okay. So, you know, we're just going to go Facebook. And now let us. Um, begin. Okay, you see there in front of you? Yes, we do. I do. Okay. Beautiful. okay. Okay. So folks, I'm going to do something a little different because uh, it's a very lengthy um, uh, six chapter over here. So I'm going to actually just do it with the English right now. And also I want to get uh, some feedback from you afterwards on how you felt about it. Um, and so I'm just going to give it outside as best as I can in, again, in the English. So Chapter six of Rambam, the laws of Shabbos. This chapter deals with the laws about a non-Jew doing something for a Jew. Now, non-Jew obviously doesn't need to keep Shabbos, but the fact that they're doing it as a proxy for the Jew, that becomes a problem. So, um, uh, and it therefore becomes forbidden for us to tell a non-Jew to perform a work for us on Shabbos for our behalf. Now, this... Uh, law applies even when you tell them before Shabbos and we don't require what they're doing until after Shabbos right why is this why is this such a law I mean if what's the difference if they do it or don't the rabbis is a rabbinic law to prevent people from regarding Shabbos in a light way plus that might also lead them because they're kind of light-minded about it, that they themselves might come to a forbidden labor that is biblically forbidden. That's law number one. Law number two, so the following rules apply that when a non-Jew does a forbidden labor, and when we're speaking about forbidden over here, we mean biblically, that they're doing it on the behalf of the Jew. So if it was performed, this forbidden act, a person has to wait until after Shabbos and the amount of time that it would take to do this act, then they can partake in whatever was performed for them. There's a leniency granted when it's coming, when it's, uh, when the matter is not of public notice, that even though the particular task was performed for the Jew on Shabbos, that, um, and a Jew has, sorry. In other words, this leniency that you can have the, the pleasure of that is when it was not done in a public, uh, public notice. In other words, others didn't see that what was done. If the non-Jew performed the labor for his own sake and the Jew has benefit, it is per uh, permitted to benefit from it on the Shabbos. So that's the general principle. Now the Rambam is going to give us some examples in law number three. So if the non-Jew kindled a, a candle, a light, and he did it for his own benefit, right? He did it for his own benefit. The Jew is permitted to, uh, to perform activity by this light. But if the, the non-Jew kindled the light on behalf of the Jew, then it becomes forbidden. Then it becomes forbidden. In a similar manner, if the non-Jew made a ramp to descend the ship for himself, a Jew can descend after it. Why? Because he did it for himself. If he made it for the Jew, though, per, per, only for the Jew, in other words, he wasn't getting off the ship, but he made the ramp to go off, and that's a, a forbidden um, act, uh, biblical act, then it's forbidden for the Jew. 
if he filled a trench with water to allow his own animal, the non-Jew, to drink, the Jew may also have his animal drink thereafter. But if he did so only for the sake of the Jew, then it becomes forbidden. And again, you have to wait until um, after Shabbos. If a non-Jew gathered grass to feed his animal, the Jew may bring his animal to eat thereafter, as long as it was not done on behalf of the Jew. If he does and it's forbidden, uh, unless we bring more... Unless he brings more on his behalf, at which point he would be performing a forbidden labor on behalf of the Jew. Now, in a similar manner, whenever there's a possibility that the non-Jew will be adding more for the Jew's behalf, in other words, he's doing it for himself, but he might add a little more, a little more grass, so the, uh, a little more water, then the Jew should not benefit unless the non-Jew doesn't know who the Jew is. In other words, he didn't increase what he is doing for the sake of the Jew. So if he knows who it is, so he's going to increase. He's adding more water. He's adding more grass. In those instances, it's forbidden. But if he added more um, and he doesn't know who the person who's partaking, then that's not a problem. Now, let's take apart this previous law in law number four. Law number four, he says that when it is something that there is no concept of increasing or decreasing, right? An example, you're lighting a, a light. So lighting a light, a kerosene light, for example, the non-Jew does for himself, he's not increasing to add more light for the Jew, or he's putting down the ramp from the ship. You know, it's, it's a complete ramp, not more or less involved over here. Since the non-Jew performed these activities for his, uh, for his own sake, for his own benefit, then the Jew can benefit th from them afterwards on Shabbos itself, even when the non-Jew knows, because it's completely for their own benefit, for the non-Jew's benefit. Now, the following law applies. When a lamp is kindled at a gathering, right? That's when, again, that's when the light was kindled for the non-Jew's own sake. The Jew can have benefit. But what if there is, he kindled the candle, the, the, the kerosene light at a gathering that there's Jews and non-Jews, a ship that has Jews and non-Jews, and he kindled it for the benefit of everybody. So if most of the people that are in attendance there are Jewish, then it would be forbidden to have the benefit from that light, since the one who kindles is doing it for the majority of people. So the non-Jew who kindled it is then, in, in fact, doing it for the sake of the Jews. If the majority are non-Jews, then it's permitted to benefit from the light. If they're equal proportion, then it still is forbidden. Now, there is a leniency in the following law that if a fire broke out on Shabbos and non-Jews come to extinguish it, so we may not tell him ex extinguish it because extinguishing it would be a biblical prohibition that they're doing on our behalf. Now that's, oh, this is only in an instance where there isn't a question of life and death. If there's a question of life and death, that's a different story. We're talking about here, not, not in such an instance. Now, so we don't tell them to extinguish it, but we also don't have to tell them, well, don't extinguish it because it's Shabbos. You know, don't do this on our behalf. Be why is that if we, everything else because here, this is a rabbinic law, and the rabbi said, since they're resting on the Sabbath is not our responsibility. The fact they're going to put out a fire, in this instance, there's an uh, leniency. And similar applies in all other situations. Halacha 5. The following principles apply when a non-Jew is making a coffin, digging a grave, or back in the day, they would play flutes when there was a procession of mourners over a deceased person. So if this was done discreetly, then one has, must wait until the activity would have been carried out on after Shabbos, how long it would take to carry, and I'll dig the grave, and then you can bury, uh, use that burial spot for a Jew. If, however, the grave was located in a public square, right, and the coffin was placed upon it, and those who passed by said, oh, look, 
this activity of the non-Jews of digging the grave on Shabbos um, was done for the sake of such and such, because we know he passed away and this is his, his coffin is right here. So the Jew may never be buried there using the above. Why? Because it's profaning in the public uh, in the in the public domain or in the public uh, knowledge that this was done for that Jew. Now, um, even though that Jew uh, did not even instruct that person to perform these activities, but since it was performed in the public domain, that now the people know about this, you can never be used on their behalf. Another Jew, however may be buried in that spot because it wasn't done for that particular individual, provided as people wait the amount necessary time for these activities to be performed at the conclusion of Shabbos. So if it's digging the grave, you have to wait as long as it would take to dig that grave. But again, not for the original person to be buried there, but for another Jew could be buried there. Halacha number six. The following rules apply. That when a non-Jew brings flutes, on Shabbos to mourn for the deceased person after Shabbos, even though he brought them from just outside the wall, near the wall of the city, where we're required to wait the time that it takes to bring them from a close place after the Shabbos was concluded and afterwards we may mourn with them. So we have to wait that time period that it would take. This restriction stems why? Because we have a suspicion over here that it was brought, that he brought them from another place at night and then entered with them in the morning. Back in the day, this is how they did their um, uh, signs of mourning with uh, having a, a playing this uh, with the very kind of um, heavy duty music uh, for the mourners. If one is certain that they were brought from another place on Shabbos, so one should wait the amount of time that would be possible to bring them in from that place after the conclusion of Shabbos. So the above is a leniency. And let in the uh, kind of cute. Is a leniency only when it comes from flut flutes that were brought in the public square, as we mentioned earlier. Halacha number seven. The following rule applies in regard to a city that is inhabited by Jews and not on Jews that possesses a bathhouse and it's open on Shabbos. So, and this is being used for the mikvah, right? Or actually, it's not used as a bathhouse, but we're talking about now it was heated on Shabbos it's by a non Jew. So, if the majority of bathers are there are non Jews, so then it's permitted to bathe on it Saturday night right after Shabbos is over, right? This is not actually a mikvah, this is just a bathhouse, I'm sorry. Um, so since uh, the heating was done for the majority of people on Shabbos, but the majority of people are non-Jewish, so therefore right after Shabbos we can't use it. But if the majority of bathers are there Jewish, then we have to wait the, the time that it would take from after Shabbos to heat up that body of water, and then you can use it. Um, Again, the principle over here is that the water is heated for the majority of people, and if the majority are for Jews, so then for the, we need to wait that time. Uh, halacha number eight. A Jew who instructs a non-Jew to perform a forbidden labor on his behalf on Shabbos, you've committed transgression. You're allowed to do that, right? The transgression is not a biblical one because you didn't do the work. The non-Jew did the work, but yet you are transgressing the rabbinic law. Therefore, the person should, in a time when the Jewish court had uh, the up, had the capability, would get what's called rabbinic stripes, stripes of rebellion, as it's called, as a punishment. Nevertheless, even though you, it's something you're not allowed to do, and that was done, the person is permitted to have the benefit from that labor of the non-Jew Saturday night after waiting that time for that it would take to perform that labor. So the following is the reason why the sages forbade using the products of forbidden labor until the time to perform the labor passes on Saturday night. In other words, you have to wait that time. If it was digging a grave, how long would it take to dig the grave? If it was about the bathhouse, then how long it would take to heat up the water, right? Um, <clears throat> that you can then have the, the pleasure of taking a bath in the... 
So if one is permitted to use the products of the forbidden labor immediately on Saturday night, then what might be, the, what, what, what might you tell a non-Jew? Do it on Shabbos, so at least right after Shabbos, I can have the pleasure. But if you can't have the pleasure right after Shabbos, and you'd have to wait a, that time period that it would take to heat the bathhouse or to dig the grave or whatever, then what will be? You're not going to tell the non-Jew to do it because anyways, you have to wait. So that is the the, the sole reason why uh, this of, of this halacha. Halacha number nine. A Jew is permitted to instruct a non-Jew to perform an activity that is not forbidden labor, meaning biblical, but it is only pro, uh, prohibited rabbinically. So you telling a non-Jew to tell uh, them to do something is a rabbinic law, but if the what they're going to do now and transgress is only rabbinic law, that you're allowed to do. So you're allowed to instruct that person. Um, this leaning applies provided that it, it is necessary because a person has needs some healing, even if it's minor healing. If it's a very pressing matter, like you know, you uh, you, you have produce that's outside and rain is going to come on, uh, it's going to rain and it's going to ruin the produce, right? And it's only of a rabbinic nature, the transgression of the non-Jew, or it's a mitzvah. So let's give an example, halacha number 10. On Shabbos, a Jew can instruct a non-Jew to climb a tree, which is only a rabbinic law that you're not allowed to do that, or to swim across the uh, uh, body of water, which again is also rabbinic, in order to get a shoifer or a knife for circumcision because those are mitzvah things. So therefore you're allowed to do what's called shuz de shuz, a rabbinic of a rabbinic law, you're allowed to tell them. Similarly, you can tell a non-Jew to bring hot water from one courtyard to another to wash a child or for a person experiencing difficulty, even though the, uh, an Eru has not been made to join them. So an Eru would give the permissibility, uh, but since there isn't, and it's not a public domain, it is in the courtyard, so therefore it's only a rabbinic law that you're not allowed to do that, that you're allowed to instruct because you need to wash a child or someone who's having some difficulties. Uh, halacha number 11. When a person buys a house in the land of Israel from an on Jew. So here you're allowed to tell the non Jew to compose a deed of sale on Shabbos. Um, as long as the, gen the instructions to the non Jew to perform this forbidden labor on Shabbos is of a rabbinic prohibition. And the sages here in this particular instance didn't enforce the law of um, in, in this particular area. Why? Because it's about settling the land of Israel and you're buying a, a piece of property from a non-Jew. So in such an instance, you'll be able to, uh, to tell the non-Jew to perform that, that labor. Similarly, if the principle of, uh, of buying, purchasing a home from a non-Jew would be in, in Syria, in Syria, because Syria, even though it was only conquered later on by King David, uh, has an equivalent status as Eretz Yisrael when it comes to settling the land. Halacha number 12. When a person uh, contracts a Gentile for a non-Jew for a task, and he sets a price for the non-Jew, this is what I'm giving you. $100 for this work, right? So then the non-Jew is acting on their own interest. They're doing it for themselves. Therefore, he can perform the task on Shabbos. Similarly, if it is permissible to hire a non-Jew for a prolonged period, not a set amount of money, but a, for a, prolong, a, a prolonged period, although the, he performs the forbidden labor on Shabbos. And here we're talking about biblical law that he's... Um, that he is that he is doing. What is the case scenario? So, if you person hires an Anju for a year or two as a scribe or as a weaver, so it's permissible for the Anju to write or to weave on Shabbos because they're doing it for their own sake. It's over a, a long period. It is as though you've contracted that person to write the scroll or to weave a garment, and which is. He's doing it for his own sake, for his own desire uh, as a contracted worker for a, you know, a set amount of money. 
this leniency is granted provided as you don't pay that person on a weekly basis or a daily basis or an hourly basis. In other words, you're conscious you're getting a full sum because you're paying for the hour. So then when he's working on Shabbos, you're paying him for that hour or for that day. You can't do it. Halacha number 13. When does the above apply? When this matter is done in a discreet manner. Right? And no, and people aren't aware of this, of this labor that's being performed at Shabbos is for the sake of the Jew. If, however, it is a matter that is well known and it's open to public knowledge, then it's forbidden for the Jew to have the non-Jew perform such a task, right? To do this weaving and you know that it's done because everybody knows that he's doing it for you. A person who sees this non-Jew is working, um, he doesn't know that you've hired him on a contractual basis. All he knows is that he's doing this work for you. Therefore, since it's public knowledge, not allowed to. Um, as a result, if a person hires an on-Jew to build a courtyard or a wall or to harvest a, his field, he hires him to work at a building or in his courtyard, planting a vineyard for him for a year or two. So if the, now this is the stipulation, if the project is within the city limits, right? In other words, people are going to be aware that he's working on your courtyard and your, uh, so to speak, backyard, then it would be forbidden. You're not allowed to do because then the impression will be in the minds of people who observe this, uh, they're unaware that he was hired on a contractual basis and they think that he's working for you, right? However, if where the person's working is, beyond, is not where the Jewish people are living, it's beyond the city limits, and therefore people would not see what's going on and would not be thinking that is that person's working for you, in that instance, it would be permitted. Halacha 15. Similarly, if a person uh, is permitted for a Jew to hire um, him to work in his vineyard or field, I'm sorry. Now, what happens if a Jew has a vineyard? He has a field and he wants to rent it out to a non Jew. Right? So the non Jew, he's rented it out from him. So he can sow and plant on Shabbos. Right? But since uh, observers are going to know that it's been hired out and given to the non Jew, um, then in such an instance, it would be permitted. In other words, because this is a field that it is for rent, and therefore people know that you rented it out. So therefore the non-Jew who's renting your field in such an instance would be per permitted. However, if it's an enterprise that is owned by a Jew, and it's not the type of enterprise that is uh, hired out, um, uh, leased out. And so in such an instance, um, it would be forbidden to hire this to a non-Jew because people are going to think that that person is working for you and working for you on Shabbos, right? That's a distinction. So if it's an if it's a property or an enterprise that is, that's the nature of the business is to hire it out, to lease it out, to rent it out. So in such an instance, it would be permitted. But if it's not the usual, so then another Jew is going to think it's being working for you. They might ask the question, what do we care what Jews think? That's your problem. No, it's not. The sages care what Jews think. If their Jews going to think, oh, look, look what this uh, good religious Jew is doing. So it must be that it's okay. And therefore, they're going to be very light and, and lenient when it comes to the observance of Shabbos and, uh, and not observe Shabbos properly. So therefore, it's, these laws are very important um, uh, rabbinic laws. Now, what if I have utensils? Right, and I want to hire them out. I want to lease them out. I want to rent them out. So, even though the non-Jew is going to do forbidden work with these uh, utensils, let's say I'm, you know, I've got some gardening tools or whatever, and he's going to cut the bushes. So we're not obligated to have our utensils rest on Shabbos, and therefore it's okay because it's normal to rent out things, right? If it's a normal thing that you rent out these kind of things, so not a problem. However, it would be forbidden to lend or to hire out uh, my livestock 
or a servant. Why? Because the Torah tells us very clearly that Shabbos, we are commanded to have our servants that work for us and our livestock uh, rest on Shabbos. Now, how about partnership? So the following applies. Halacha 17. If you enter in a partnership with an odd Jew concerning labor, merchandise, or an operation like a storefront, so if you initially stipulate that whatever profits are going to be made on the Shabbos, whether large or small, is going to be given and totally um, the profit will go to the non-Jew and the, and a profit of another day will be given completely to the Jew. So let's say the Jew is going to make the profit from Monday and the non-Jew is going to make the profit from, from Shabbos. Such an arrangement is permissible. Right? If, however, there's no such condition, from the outset, then the two, when they come to divide the profits, the non-Jew has to take the complete profits of Shabbos. And then the rest of the six days, they will split equally. Now, what if the stipulation was, in the halacha number 18, what if the stipulation was made and the partners came to divide the profits and the profits of Shabbos was not distinct, Right, you didn't have the tipper. Uh, you didn't have the 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 you know the the machine showing you like today. You know how much profit was made in each sale and each day, and you don't know. So it, the Rambam says it appears to me that the that the non-Jew should take a seventh of the profits alone, because we again we don't know the amounts that were made every day. He has to take a seventh of the profits, and the remainder should be divided equally from the rest of the six days. That's when you go into business and say, what, how about if it's an investment? So the two may divide equally the profits, despite the fact that the, the non-Jew is engaging business dealings with the funds on Shabbos. As the Go'enim uh, concur in this particular ruling. Halacha number 19. Now, how about utensils um, that should not be given to a non-Jew in a professional fashion on Friday, despite the fact that um, you've established the price, unless there is time for him to remove them from the Jew's home before Shabbos begins. In other words, coming to you and getting you know, some uh, clippers for the, uh, to clip the trees and the, and the bushes, the person has to be able to get back to their home uh, before Shabbos. Similarly, a person shouldn't say, should not sell, lend, pawn, or give a present of his possessions to a non-Jew unless that non-Jew can leave the entrance of the Jew's home with that particular article before Shabbos. As long as a non-Jew is in the Jew's home, no one knows whether it was given to him. Uh, when, or sorry, when it was given to him, it was given to him on Shabbos. And person, oh look, they did business on Shabbos. That's a non-Jew has to leave the Jew's home. Uh, so if he would, sorry, if the non-Jew would leave the Jewish home on the Shabbos with the possession on hand, it would appear as if it was lent to him, pawned to him, or agreed on the work, or sold to him on Shabbos. Not allowed. Halacha number 20. The, uh, if a person gives a letter to a non-Jew to bring to another city, Pony Express, so if there was a fixed fee for the letter, then it would be permitted even if the non-Jew uh, conveys it and brings it on Shabbos. This, leans, this is a leniency. It applies even when the Jew gives the letter to the, to the non-Jew on Friday right before Shabbos, provided at least the non-Jew leaves the, city, the Jew's home before Shabbos begins. In other words, because it's still going to take him time to get to his destination, but still he has to leave the home of the Jew before Shabbos. It doesn't look like the transaction took place on Shabbos, but it, it has to leave. But And even though there isn't enough time to get to the destination. Now, if the fee was not fixed beforehand, so then um, that's only, again, when there was a fixed fee, right? So therefore he's doing it for his own benefit now um, for the fixed fee. If there wasn't a fixed fee, and there is a designated person in the city who does collect letters and send them to other cities with his agent. So it's permitted to give the non-Jew the letter, provided again, there's time on Friday for this letter to reach the house, at least outside of the city limits. So it's like a post office that, you know, that it could be already reaching outside the city limits. 
uh, halacha number 21. It is permissible for a non-Jew carrying his possessions to bring them into the Jew's house on Shabbos. It is permissible for the Jew to tell the non-Jew, place them in this corner. Why? Because they're a possession of the non-Jew. Even though uh, there might be some kind of uh, perception here, but it is not his possessions. So not a problem. One may invite a non-Jew to visit on Shabbos and serve food to, the, to a non-Jew. If he took uh, the food outside of the Jew's home, there isn't a difficulty with that. Why? For one isn't obligated to see that he observes the Shabbos. Right? In other words, he's taking food. It wasn't like you sold him food. You gave him food. Not a problem. In a similar manner, one may serve food to a dog in one's courtyard. If he takes it outside, there is no difficulty. Allah 22. When a person is carrying money while traveling on a journey and the Shabbos commences, he should give his wallet to an anju to carry for him. And on Saturday night, he may take it back from him. This is permitted even though he did not pay the non-Jew for his services, even though he gave it to him uh, right as Shabbos was beginning. Why? Well, there's a leniency over here, right? In other words, he's doing something for you, uh, the non-Jew. What's the leniency? It was granted over here because people are distraught about their money and therefore they can't bear to discard it. Shabbos is coming. So therefore, the rabbis made this leniency that you can give it to the non-Jew to carry it for you, even though it's forbidden. Um, uh, forbidden. Why? Because this whole decree to begin with, that a non-Jew shouldn't do something for you, is only a rabbinic decree. So they didn't make it in such an instance. Why? Because we're, we're worried that if you're not going to, you're not going to throw away your money, you're not going to throw away your wallet. Uh, we're afraid that therefore you're going to transgress the biblical law, so better to give it to the non-Jews that he should uh, carry it for you. Allah number 23, the following rule, rules apply when a Jew performs a forbidden labor on Shabbos. If he is willingly, uh, if he willingly transgress, it is forbidden for him to benefit from his labor forever, if he did it purposefully. Right? Other Jews may, however, benefit from the labor immediately after the conclusion of Shabbos, um, and what, so what does this mean? So if a Jew cooks food on Shabbos and willingly violating the laws of Shabbos, other Jews may partake of it Saturday night. He, however, is forbidden partaking from it forever because uh, he is a biblical uh, prohibition. If he cooked it without knowing of the prohibition that he was violating, both he and others may eat immediately after the conclusion of Shabbos, why? Because, again, he didn't, wasn't aware of it and didn't do it in order that he can have it after Shabbos. You don't have to even wait after uh, for any time that it took to cook. Halacha number 24, when the produce was taken outside the city's Shabbos limits and then brought back without the knowledge of prohibition involved, he may partake of it on Shabbos. Uh, but since nothing was done to the fruits themselves and nothing's changed, if they were brought back in a willful violation of the prohibition involved, he may not partake of them until after the conclusion of Shabbos. Last, Allah 25, when a person hires a worker to watch a cow or a baby, he should not pay him a wage for the Shabbos day. Therefore, the worker is not responsible for what happens on Shabbos because he's not a paid uh, um, uh, paid for that particular day. If the worker was hired on the weekly or annual basis, he is given full payment. Therefore, the worker is responsible for the what happens on the, on Shabbos. If the latter instance, the worker should not say, pay me for Shabbos, but rather pay me for the year or pay me for the 10 days. It's important that he says it in such a manner. Whew. Finished chapter six. So the laws of between a Jew and a non-Jew. Okay, we finished Amir al Nahri. Um, okay, so chapter number seven, it's actually a much shorter chapter. Um, this, we start the discussion, and I think the rest of the chapters on the laws of Shabbos will be continuing this discussion of melochis, of, of uh, work that, you know, we, we know that we're not allowed to do work on Shabbos, creative work on Shabbos. But what does it include? What does it include? What are the uh, general categories? What are the subcategories, et cetera, et cetera? Or we're going to call them parent categories and children categories. Um, and that's what we're going to start the discussion with over here in chapter number seven, halacha aleph, halacha number one.
Malachis. Malachis is forbidden labor. It's the whenever we say the word malacha, malacha is a type of labor that is not allowed to be done on Shabbos. It's called a malacha. Malacha means a, a, a work, an action. So malachis, these, these works, shechayav and alei and skila vikaris, that if you do, you are you you uh, you are either get capital punishment, which is skila, one of the four versions of capital punishment. Or kares, uh, and and uh, you get kares. Kares means to be cut off from Hashem. So b'meizid, that's when you do these malachas on purpose, um, you, meaning that you know that it's Shabbos and you do it anyways, and you have you know etc. Or 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 the, the, uh, if you did the same thing but by mistake, so then you have to bring a sacrifice a carbon chatos. Um, a, a sacrifice in the temple. So mayhan avais, so mayhan told this. So when in these categories of of malachis, of work of forbidden labors, we have some of them that are called avais, which literally translates as fathers, and uh, uh, and told this, which is uh, which is something that we learn out of it. So we have parent categories and children categories when it comes to these uh, to these things that you're not allowed to do on Shabbos. Well, minion kolavis malachis, and the uh, and the amount of the total. Of, of general category malachis, the, the parent category uh, labors are 40 minus 1, there's 39 malachis that you're not allowed to do on Shabbos. And what are they? So number one, I'm going to go through it in the English, it'll be a little easier for you guys. Um, so number one, plowing, number two, sowing, number three, reaping, number four, collecting sheaves, number five, threshing, number six, winnowing, no, number seven, separating. Number eight, grinding. Number nine, sifting. Number 10, kneading. Number 11, baking. Number 12, shearing. Number 13, whitening. Number 14, beating. Number 15, dying. Number 16, spinning. Number 17, making heddles. Number 18, mounting the, mounting the warp. Number 19, weaving. I'll go back up. Number 20, undoing woven fabric. Number 21, tying. Number 22, untying. Number 23, sewing. Number 24, tearing. Number 25, building. Number 26, demolishing. Number 27, beating with a hammer. Number 28, trapping. Number 29, slaughtering. Number 30, skinning. Number 31, processing hides. Number 32, removing hair. Number 33, cutting leather. Number 34, writing. Number 35, erasing. Number 36, ruling lines. Number 37, kindling a flame. Number 38, extinguishing a flame. Number 39, transferring from one domain to another. Okay, so that was the marathon. Halacha uh, number two. Uh, that was the marathon through the different cat general category malachas. And now, any of these workings, any of these labors, um, and something that's connected, that's th that is this type of labor, is called an av malachas which is the parent category of labor. So what's the idea? Whether someone is, go is going to plow, whether someone's going to dig in the ground, or if someone's going to make a groove, make like a ditch on the, uh, on the side uh, of the ground, it all goes into the first category of malacha, which is harisha, which is plowing, and there and, and is, is av malacha. Because each one is digging in the ground. The Indian Echadu, and it is one idea. Halacha Gimel, number three. The Chain, and similarly, has it as Rain. If someone's going to plant seeds, or if he's going to plant a tree, right? So whether it's seeds for, for vegetable patch or to plant a tree. If someone also grafts, he takes a branch off of one tree and he grafts it into the ground or into another tree, etc. So, the, and this is, this is also... Um, uh, other types of, of uh, uh, whether it's grafting or pruning a tree, etc. Call elu av echod men meavas malachis. These are all part of the planting av malacha. The Indian echod when it's one idea. Kolach men it's a meach. It's all about planting in order to, uh, for something to grow. Daver who miskavet. That's what he is trying to accomplish. Number four, the chain hakoitzer tvoa oikitnis, and someone who who reaps uh, whether it's grain. Or it's beans or, or legumes, right? So either one. Oh yeah, or Or someone who's harvesting grapes. Oh yeah, or 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 if it's dates. Oh yeah, or olives. Oh yeah, or or figs. 
Kol elu av malacha It's all in one. Uh, it's one av malacha. It's one. Uh, it's it, it's all the same parent category of uh, uh, of of reaping in the field. Uh, each one is to take something uh, away from where it grew. And that, and, and similarly, so the, 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 the Rambam brings three examples, um, and he says the same thing would apply in all the other parent category malachis. That if you're doing anything that's the same idea, it's considered to be a av malacha, a parent category malacha. Number five, hate lada. So now we said that there's parent categories and there's children categories, there's subcategories of each parent category. There's a bunch of subcategories, and that is teilada. So teilada, the a, a derivative, he amalacha doim lav meilo avis. It's it's a it's a labor that's similar. It's not the same labor. Before we brought that it's the same labor, so then it goes in the parent category. If it's just a similarity, if it's a similar category, if it's similar labor, so then it is considered to be a teilada, a, a subcategory. Kate he gives an example. A mechadich has a yerek. If someone cuts vegetables in, a, 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 you know, very, very small, ma'at, ma'at, very, very small, lavashloi, in order to cook it. It's, it, it, this is, this is, this he can't do. Shizu is 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 one of the uh, one of the category malachis, which is to grind. You're not allowed to grind. So whether you're doing grinding, so the grinding is talking about grinding with a in, with a stone, etc. A proper way of grinding. But if you do grinding even with a with a with a knife, it's not the regular thing of grinding, but it is similar enough that it is considered to be a subcategory of because grinding is to take one piece and to make it into many pieces. If you do something similar, so it is a subcategory of uh, grinding and, and and similarly if 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 someone if if someone takes a strip of metal and pulverizes it in order to use the powder like a, like a, like like a goldsmith does this is also um, an idea of grinding because again the idea of grinding is to take one thing and to make many pieces of it um, so it's a subcategory of grinding if someone takes milk Right, and then takes the, the, the piece of intestine in order to in order to make it, in order to curdle it, in order to in, to make it into whatever cheese or something like that. So So the, just the action of putting putting it inside, um, he is he he's he's liable from the fact that he is separating something. because he's separating curds from the from the milk. But if and, and if he ultimately makes cheese out of it, he makes cheese. Then that 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 goes into a subcategory of baina of building. If you take it, because what's the concept of building? That you're taking multiple different things and you're making one out of it. So that's what you're taking pieces and pieces and making sticking them together. Actually, also good for until it becomes one piece. I raise a daim labinian. It's like building. And similarly, for all parent categories, Yeshla and Taldis, all there is a Shomarno, they all have subcategories as we have mentioned. And when you look at the actual action that you're doing, so you'll know which parent category it is, the Teledes Eza of he, and the subcategory, which 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 subcategory of which parent category it is. Halacha number seven. So now it doesn't matter if you're, it, it, whether you did a parent category uh, 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 or a subcategory, a regular, uh, a high, uh, the, one of the 39 or a subcategory of them, if you did it on purpose, b'meizid, chayv kares, kares means that you get cut off from Hashem, being bo and if and if witnesses came and warned you and 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 you did it anyways, and it comes in front of Bezdin, nisko, you get capital punishment. That's that that's if you do it on purpose. B'shoigeg, what if you did it by mistake? Chayv chatas kavua. So then you have to bring a a, a sacrifice, a carbon chatas, a sacrifice. 
Im Kain, so the Rambam continues. So if so, Mahafish bin Yeah, Yesh bin Avis what the this. So what's the difference? So why did we make parent categories and subcategories? What's the difference if it, ultimately it's the same thing as we see as the punishment is the same? So So if you do it on purpose, there's no difference. But if you do it not on purpose, and when it comes to the sacrifice, there is a difference. And what's the difference in the halacha? If you did it by mistake. If you did multiple parent category um, uh, works. Um, no. Uh, what's the word? The... Uh, uh, whatever work malacha. If you did, if you did a a, a few labor. parent category, huh? labor. labor. Oh, labor. That's the word I was looking for. If you did multiple labors and each labor is a different parent category, right? And you did it in one, forgetting that it was Shabbos or forgetting that you're not allowed to do this on Shabbos, right? But it, it, there, you didn't remember in the middle. So Chayev, but still, if it, they were each from a different parent category, Chayev Chatos Achas Al Av Av. You need to bring one sacrifice for each parent category uh, labor that you did. Vim also of until base of Balamechod. But what if you did a parent category and some of its subcategories from the same parent category in one in one forgetting about Shabbos in a chayav elchatas echos? So then you only obligated to bring one sacrifice, one chatas ketzad. And the Rambam goes in halacha eight gives an example. Areish If someone plows the field vizora and he plants. The Kotzar and he cut, he, he, he sowed, he, he reaped from, from the field, Beshabbos, Behelam Echad, in one forgetting that it was Shabbos. He forgot today was Shabbos, or he forgot that you're not allowed to do this on Shabbos. So, Chayev Shalish Chatois. So, these are three parent categories that he did. He needs to bring three sacrifices. Even if he did 39 of them, 40 minus one, 39 of them uh, by mistake, he got in She'elo Amloches, Asuris, last Shabbos. Like, for, for example, he forgot that you're not allowed to do these on Shabbos. Chayev Akom, Lacho, so for each one of the labors, uh, uh, parent category labors, he has to bring another sacrifice, another chatos. But what happens if he cut up uh, uh, vegetables very small, like we mentioned before, which is a, a subcategory of uh, of china uh, of 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 uh, grinding. Of grinding, right, and and uh, and then he also took this metal, and he and, and like you know in the fire, and he also it took off parts of the metal, and there was also which is a subcategory of of grinding. So then, he's only he only has to bring one chatos, one sacrifice. He only did one parent category and its subcategories. And as you can see, similarly. That's the halacha. Halacha number nine. If he did many, uh, if he did many labors, um, that is sim- that is all from similar to one uh, one pa- parent category in one shot in one forgetting. So then he only has to bring one sacrifice. If someone plants and it plants it plants uh, vegetables and, and plants a tree and 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 grafted etc. Did a bunch of things that are connected and they're all parent category things, but they're all from one parent category. So then he only brings one sacrifice because it's all, all these actions all come from one parent category and the same thing goes similarly. And with that, we finish the introduction to the 39, um, 39 uh, labors that you're not allowed to do on shops. Label, I, I can continue. I'm okay. Perfect. Shkaya, thank you. Yosef. Good afternoon, good morning. For anyone, good night? No? <laughs> Not yet. What, okay. Once we finish, it might be nighttime already. Exactly. All right, moving right along to chapter number eight in Shabbat. We started discussing last chapter the the what's known as the 39 melachot, the 39 things that are forbidden to do on Shabbat. And now my modern Rambam is going to go into detail a little bit. So let's start with Hachoresh, one who plows. Hachoresh kol shehu, 
If someone plows even a slight amount, he is liable. Hamanakesh be kare ilanis. If a mekarsem a savim oy hamizare des a serigin te leapis as a karka is it bloodish chodesh mishiasa koshu chai. One who weeds around the roots of the tree or cuts grass or prunes shoots or beautifies his garden. All of uh, uh, these are all the subcategory of plowing. And therefore, you are liable even if you do a little amount. Uh, similarly, one who levels a surface, you know, you take, you, 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 you fill up a, a, a hole or you, or you flatten something that is also considered you're liable, even just doing a, a slight amount. Number two, now let's move on to someone that sows, if you seed. Um, then uh, even a little bit, you are liable. If a, uh, if a person prunes a tree, and it's also considered in the category of, of sowing, but if somebody uh, waters the plants, that is actually considered a subcategory. It's a tulda of sowing. Likewise, someone who soaks the seeds, you know, wheat or barley in water, that is also a subcategory, a tolda of sowing. Number three, he's going into details and saying what is considered an ab, what is considered the main melacha, the main thing that's not allowed, and then what are certain things that are considered the tolda, the subcategory, and the ramifications of that we spoke earlier. Number three. One who reaps an amount of a size of a gregarious, which is a dried fig, is liable. Plucking is considered um, reaping. Anybody that removes a, a produce from it, the way it grows, is considered uh, is liable for reaping. Therefore, a person who removes grass from a rock or, or from a plant or from something that grows outside of a barrel, all of that is considered, uh, because that's the place where it grows, ripping that off would be considered, would be considered the, you'd be liable for reaping. But if you removed from a plant that is in a pot that is not connected to the ground. So because this is not the place where it grew, therefore you are not liable. Now, what if you have a plant, but it's on the ground and there's a little hole between the bottom of the plant and the ground and enough for enough for something to go through that it is considered touching the ground. And if you, if you pluck it from there, it is considered plucking it from the place where it grows. Number four. Whatever reaping from a plant, uh, whenever reaping from a plant causes it to grow better, for example, cattle grass or beets, if you do it, then you're 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 doing two things wrong at the same time. You you then you have to bring two sacrifices. You do two sins. One is because you're plucking, and one is because you're making it grow, because that helps the plant grow altogether. Um, similarly, a person that prunes a tree and desires the use of the branches uh, uh, for let's say burning, for let's say a fire. So then here you're you're liable for plucking, but you're also liable for helping the tree grow. A clot of earth on which grass is growing. If you grew, if you took it off the ground and you put it somewhere else, then you are, then you're, you're liable for, for plucking, for uprooting. Now, if it was on top of, let's say, uh, something not on the ground, it was on a step, and you put it on the ground, now you're liable for planting because you put it connected to the ground. Uh, figs that dried out while on the tree. And likewise, a tree that its fruit has dried out. If you pluck off the, the, the fruit of it, you are still liable, even though when it comes to the laws of pure uh, of ritual purity, it would be considered that it's not connected to the ground, but in, in regards to Shabbat, 
Even though it's dry, it's considered connecting to the ground and you will be liable. Number five. One who uproots, uh, I don't know what this is. Chicory. 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 I think we need a translation for chicory, but uh, chicory. It's, uh, a, it's, a, it's a plant that uh, your wife probably uses uh, once a year. So. <laughs> all right. One who uproots, I never saw it on the shopping list. One who uproots chicory or who prunes moist shoots. Uh, if you plucked it in order to eat, then the minimal uh, then the minimal amount is is kigregeres, which is a uh, what's a kigregeres? A dried fig, yes. Right. But if you uproot it for an animal share, it's the amount of a full mouthful of, of a young uh, a young goat. If you took it to burn, you have to have enough to burn an egg. If somebody is collecting food, if you did it, if you're collecting food to eat, then it's like a dry, the amount that you'll be liable is minimum a dried fig. If you collected food in order for the animals, the amount to fill a young goat's mouth. If you collect it to make a fire, you have to collect enough in order to cook an egg. The type of egg that we are referring to is an average sized chicken egg. When we say, whenever we say that we need the amount necessary to cook an egg, we don't mean to cook the full egg. Even you just have to be able, to, you just has to be able to cook uh, the portion of an egg which is the size of a dried fig, which is one third of the egg. Um, and 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 collecting food applies only with regards to produce from the earth, meaning it doesn't mean collecting from the fridge. Number six, a person who collects figs and makes from them, uh, um, you know, uh, you, you, you know, you dry figs, you know, when you buy in the store, you take, you know, there's that round thing that the dried fig. So let's say a person collects figs and he makes that dried fig thing. Or he took um, he took string and he put it through the dates and he made it into one. Hareza tells me, this is forbidden because it's considered collecting because you're putting it all into one place. That would be a, a, a subcategory of uh, of collecting. Number seven, Hadash Kigrageras, a person who threshes the um, uh, the amount of a dried fig. Again. Thrashing is only something that's uh, earth produce. Um, extracting produce from its shell, you know, taking something out of its shell, that is considered, that is a tolda, a subcategory of threshing. Someone who milks, um, uh, someone who milks an animal, you are, uh, you are, you are, you're liable for extracting food for the, uh, the, uh, Sin of extracting food. The same one, a person who wounds an animal um, that has a hide is liable for extracting. That's if you need the blood. That will come out of the, the, this, um, this, uh, the wound. If you're just doing it to damage, because then, then, you're, then you're not liable because you're just destroying. And for destroying, you're not liable. Again, all, when it comes to the amount of blood and the amount of milk uh, that you are liable, it has to be the size of a dried fig. Number eight. What are we talking about that you're not liable is when you make a wound on an animal, a wild beast, or a bird. But if you hit another person, even though you say, what do you mean? I shouldn't be high for hitting another person um, for, for drawing blood or for make damage because I'm only damaging the person. But why did you hit the person? When you hit the person, now you feel great. You feel better about yourself because otherwise you wouldn't do it. 
And therefore, because you made yourself better, so it's considered fixing, you're con being constructive. So therefore, you are liable for hitting another person. I guess that would also apply if you do that for an animal to make you feel better. But most people, you know, talking about regular people, that wouldn't do that. Number nine. There are eight creeping animals mentioned in Torah. that have skin on it. When it comes to Shabbos, they are they are in the same category: um, animals, beasts, and and a bird. But other uh, other creepy animal, uh, uh, creepy crawlies, whatever you want to call them, creepy crawlies. Yeah, uh, they don't have uh, skin. Therefore, they are they have their own category. Therefore, if you do. Um, Damage if you get, put a wound on them, if you then you're not liable. Any type of animal, any type of creeping animal, any of them, if blood comes out, then you are considered um, you are considered liable, or you made a bruise that had internal bleeding, then you're also considered uh, you are liable in this case. Number 10. If someone squeezes a fruit in order to take out juice, you are you're liable for the, the sin of extracting. So you, you need, it needs to be minimum of a dried fig. It's only a biblical um, prohibition for olives and grapes. But however, you are permitted allowed to you are permitted to squeeze a, a cluster of grapes directly into the food. Since the liquid that is being absorbed into the food is considered as food, so it's like you're considered to be extracting food from food, so therefore you're allowed. But if you took the grapes and you did it in a cup, then you're not allowed. Potter, the Enech, Chayav, Ache, Yachlon, Sechakli. Likewise, one who's milked directly, if you milk directly into the food, then it's fine. Or, or a child that sucks from, with, with his, uh, that, or, or a child, or if you, if you suck the milk directly out of the animal, I guess, you're not, you're not uh, liable unless it goes straight into a vessel. That is when you are considered liable. Number 11, a person who winnows or separates, a zayre is like when they used to, you see in, in the, they don't do, you know, you throw something in the ear and then the shells fall and then the seeds fall somewhere else. It's a way to, it's a way to um, separate. Or if you separate actually with your hands, then if you do it for the, with the size of a dry fig, then you are, uh, liable. Um, causing milk to curdle is, is meaning making her, uh, milk hard is a derivative. Sorry, yes. Curdle is, is making the milk hard or 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 letting the milk uh, settle. I think it's making the milk settle. That is considered separating. Uh, similarly, a person who separates um, pieces, um, pulp, from drink, from any drink that is considered a uh, separating, or it's considered a, uh, a subcategory of, uh, of winnowing. And because all of these three things are one thing, it's really separating two things. They're together, and then you want now you want them separate. And this is a very interesting rule. So why, if they're the same thing, why do we mention it into three? And the, and the answer is, these 39 melachos, where do they come from? Why do we, is specifically these 39 and not other ones? Is because these are things that were done in the Mishkan. And because they were done in the Mishkan, that's what makes it considered work. And therefore, we count it. So therefore, that these three things were done in the Mishkan, that's why we count them. Number 12. A person who separates food from unwanted, from un, un, food from unwanted food, or he separates one type of food from another using a sifter or a strainer, he is liable. If one separates using a tray or a pot, 
with compartments, then you're not liable. But if you took it with your hand, let's say you want to take something and you want to eat it, that's totally fine. We're talking about separating just to put away or, or you're not eating right away. Number 13. So that is taking the good out of the bad. Now let's talk about the opposite way around. If you're taking the bad out of the good. Meaning, let's say you want to take something, you know, uh, your, your child has a, a bowl of chicken soup and doesn't like carrots. You want to pull the carrot out. There's something similar like that. You want to take the bad out of the good. You're not allowed to take the bad out of the good, even with your hand, and then you're considered liable. liable. Even if he, um, a person who separates turmus beans from their uh, from their from their uh, shell is liable because the shell make it sweeter when they're when they cook together. It, therefore, it's considered taking an unwanted matter from the food uh, from food. And therefore, you're liable because the shells are good. So by taking it out, it's like you're taking something that uh, un, uh, that's unwanted. If somebody takes out food, out of good food, out of something that's not good, if he's if he's uh, to put it away, meaning not eating it right away, that's considered doing it to store. Um, and then it's you're not allowed. You're liable. If you have two types of food and you want to eat one specifically, take it and eat it right away. If you did, if you separated the type of food, you had uh, you know you had grapes together with the strawberries, and you start separating them. If it's to eat it right away, you're allowed to. But if it's in order to get it ready for later on in the day, then you're not allowed to do that. Number 14, I'm Shamer Yayin Oy Shemen Oy Mayim, a person who filters. Um, sorry, I'm Shamer Yayin Oy Shemen Oy Mayim, Ken Shamer Mashkin Bim Shamer and Shalan Chayo. If someone filters out wine, oil, or water, or other liquids using an utensil that is made for uh, filtering, then you are liable. Vushi Shamer Kikagas, as long as you do it enough for a dry thing. I'm Sad of a Masanin Yayin, Shame by Shmarna, Imam Sul and Misudar, Bichnifa Misik, they she had Salo Biyoisa. But what if, but if you, if you're filtering it, not because there are any pieces in there, you just want it to be a little bit more clear than it is right now, then that's fine. Benoistin Mai Magabi Shmarin Bishvil, she had Salo, you're allowed to pour water. Over, over, um, you know, dried uh, grapes. Uh, sorry, raisins or dried uh, shells of uh, grapes. Um, so they will become clear, meaning cleaning them. You may place a raw egg in in a, in a mustard strainer so that it will become clear. One was mixed mustard on Friday. Um, to the next day, you're allowed to use the, the you're, you're allowed to uh, stir it by hand in order to drink it. Uh, wine that is, is in the process of fermentation, you may pour out a barrel of wine together with pieces over a handkerchief. Um, in order that to, to separate some of the pieces of wine, so it, it uh, and, and the reason the reason why you're allowed to do that in order to drink it better. The reason why that in that scenario it's allowed is because the pieces uh, they they weren't separated yet from the wine and they're still considered one single mixture. And likewise with the mustard, because it's considered one single mixture, so then it's fine. Number 15, if somebody grinds uh, the amount, the minimum amount is like a dried fig. Anyone that crushes spices or herbs, um, it, is con it is the same, you're liable for grinding. A person who cuts a vegetable that has been detached already from its source into small pieces, that is a subcategory of grinding. 
Also, if a person saw, uh, saws wood in order to benefit from the sawdust. Um, also, if you file a piece of metal in order because you want the small pieces, so that is a subcategory of grinding. But a person who chops wood is not liable for grinding until he produces enough chips to cook the amount of an egg size of the size of a dried fig, like we spoke earlier. Number 16 in the final of the third chapter for today. A person who sifts the amount of a dried fig is liable. Halosh kigagaras. A chai of someone who needs dough the size of a dried fig is liable. Hamagabalas offer is a pledish. Lush mixing earth is a subcategory of needing. The Kamashir Kde Lasis Pik Kur Shel Tsefizov. What's the minimum amount? The amount necessary to make uh, for a goldsmith. Um, Pik Kur. The. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that is. That is the amount necessary to make for a goldsmith. It's a, it's I guess a crucible. A, a crucible means where he, uh, where he heats it up. You know, the heating up of the uh, of the gold. Oh, so we need the amount right. to heat up that uh, crucible of for a goldsmith. Got it. Right. The activity of mixing cement cannot be performed with ash, coarse sand. Bran or the like. If a person who places sesame seeds, flax seeds, or the like in the water is liable for kneading, because they actually become attached and knead on their own, so therefore you cannot put it in the water. And with this, we finish the final third chapter for today. Wow, amazing. <laughs> a lot there. Do we have any questions, any comments, any thoughts, any uh, difficulties? <laughs> all right, beautiful. Thank you all. Um, quite amazing. This is- I have a quick uh, question, Rabbi. Sure, go ahead. A, a hard boiled egg, are you allowed to take the shell off uh, on, on Sabbath or you have yeah. to peel it first then before Sabbath? Yeah, you could. You, you could because the the that's the only way that you can um, engage in that. So even though the shell is something you don't want, and we call that borer, right? Taking the bad from the good. Mm -hmm. The bad from the good is when uh, what was the example, Yosef? You recall that? What was the example? That that's only when you know there's another way to get to it. The only way you can get to it is through the bad. So, you know, that's the, what's called derech achila, the way of eating. That's the way okay. of eating. So therefore it is permissible to, to remove the, uh, the shell that way. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you, good question, excellent. Any other questions? All right, um, difficulties, it's a labyrinth. Yes, there's a lot here. It is true, but um, little by little, we are, uh, you know, we're, we're gaining the background. And even though all of it, I'm sure, is not entering, don't worry, not everything for me is uh, perfectly clear either. You know, what I teach, I have greater clarity and, and the other parts, uh, I'm, uh, you know, also going through it as you are. So not all of it will be you know, we'll get a clarity, but we're going to get principles out of it that little by little, we're going to build on it and we're going to gain greater and greater clarity with time. Thank you. Yes, old Rabbi Fines. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, all. Yes. Thank thank you, you Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. God bless you all. Bye-bye.